Of all the hellebore forces that operated throughout the Vietnam War, none struck more fear into the hearts of enemy troops than the air cavalry. These multi-purpose reconnaissance units performed some of the most daring missions of the entire conflict, tracking down elusive enemy troops and forcing them to fight in a war that had no boundaries and no clear order of battle. This is the story of how just one of those units, the Air Cavalry Squadron of the 1st Cavalry Division, performed their incredible missions. It's the story of bold scout pilots who flew just above the treetops, scouring jungle terrain for the depression of enemy footprints, for the smell of enemy campfires, or for the flash of enemy gunfire. It's the story of how the scouts operated in lethal hunter-killer teams with helicopter gunships. How the crews of those gunships fought to keep the scouts alive during their relentless pursuit of the enemy. And how they attacked and pinned the enemy down with withering barrages of fire from one of the most potent weapon systems of all time. And it's the story of rifle platoons, of flight crews who hovered into thousands of hostile landing zones, braving enemy fire and unforgiving terrain and of the small infantry units that they inserted to flush out and engage the enemy in battle. It's the story of a unique group of men who fought hard to defend South Vietnam against communist aggression, and who in the process helped to validate the effectiveness of the very first air mobile ground division in the world. It is the story of the air cavalry in Vietnam. On October 14, 1964, the U.S. Army launched a massive war game known as Air Assault II. The maneuver was a final test for the 11th Air Assault Division, an experimental unit created to evaluate the concept of Army air mobility. The first phase of the exercise called for finding, fixing, and destroying mock guerrilla elements dispersed over 6,000 square miles of terrain. Scout pilots from the division's Air Cavalry Squadron conducted low-level reconnaissance in Bell OH-13 Sioux helicopters, scouring the countryside from just above the treetops. In a remarkably short time, the guerrillas revealed their positions and the scouts radioed for reinforcements. With word that enemy forces had been sighted, sky troopers from the division piled aboard a group of Bell UH-1 Iroquois, more commonly known as Hueys, in a matter of minutes, the massive flight of choppers was lifting off the ground and maneuvering into tight formations for a dramatic airborne assault. The concept of an air mobile fighting force had a long history in the U.S. military. Following the Second World War, military planners realized that parachutes and gliders were costly and extremely inefficient solutions to battlefield mobility. During the Korean War, American commanders learned that difficult terrain and a numerically superior enemy could offset the qualitative superiority of U.S. troops and firepower. Hundreds of studies were conducted throughout the 50s and early 60s in an attempt to integrate helicopters into the combat and support functions of the Army. The culmination of these efforts was Air Assault II, and it turned out to be a resounding success. In the first phase of the test, ground-based artillery and heavily armed Hueys paved the way for the insertion of ground forces. The guerrilla force never stood a chance against such an onslaught. For a solid month, Similar maneuvers were conducted against even larger conventional forces. Regardless of the tactical situation, the division repeatedly proved that it could seek out, fix, and destroy the enemy with devastating regularity. The Air Cavalry Squadron, which performed reconnaissance and security for the division, proved to be crucial to the force's overall success. In less than a year, the experimental 11th Air Assault Division had assumed the name of the Army's famed 1st Cavalry Division, 
and had received orders to deploy to Southeast Asia. Its mission, avert a major crisis that was developing in South Vietnam. During the summer of 1964, the communist government of North Vietnam began deploying regular army units toward South Vietnam. The troops were being sent to bolster the Viet Cong, who were waging a communist war of insurgency against the South Vietnamese government. In July of 65, as the 1st Cavalry Division prepared to ship out, another full regiment of the North Vietnamese Army had completed infiltration training and was preparing to head southward. The troops traveled on foot, carrying large quantities of food, weapons, and supplies across hundreds of miles of mountainous jungle terrain. The infiltration route crossed from North Vietnam into neighboring Laos, moved southward, and ultimately ended up in eastern Cambodia, southeastern Laos, or the Pleiku province of South Vietnam. A steady stream of men and supplies continued to pour into the region throughout the war. Large jungle bases were created where food and equipment could be stockpiled, medical care could be administered, battle plans could be devised and even rehearsed, and weapons could be cleaned and prepared for battle. During the fall of 65, a full division of North Vietnamese troops staging from these bases launched a major offensive against South Vietnamese and U.S. installations in an area known as the Central Highlands. The objective of the offensive was to rejuvenate the communist insurgency with a major victory. Ultimately, the communists hoped to capture a provincial capital, destroy a large South Vietnamese forest, and even split the country in two from the Cambodian border out to the South China Sea. The 1st Cavalry Division arrived in Vietnam during the fall of 1965. By early October, the force had set up a base camp near the city of An Khe in the Central Highlands. Initially, the division defended special forces camps in the Highlands against a series of NVA assaults. By late October, the force had become embroiled in a series of violent skirmishes that came to be known as the Battle of the Aya Drang. Realizing that thousands of NVA and Viet Cong troops were mounting a massive campaign, the division launched an unlimited offensive to search out, fix, and destroy enemy forces throughout the Central Highlands. During the campaign, and in hundreds of similar operations that followed, the force relied heavily on the unique capabilities of the 1st Squadron of the 9th Cavalry, the division's Air Cavalry Squadron. The squadron was made up of three air cavalry troops, each of which had its own scout platoon, aerial weapons platoon, and rifle platoon. Pilots from the scout platoon formed the tip of the squadron's spear, conducting low-level reconnaissance and light observation helicopters. In low-threat environments, the scouts operated in pairs known as white teams. One pilot flew just a few feet above the ground or trees to conduct close-in reconnaissance while another flew slightly higher to provide cover, radio relay, and navigation. Each morning, white teams launched just before dawn on first light missions to search for snipers, sappers, and other enemy forces setting up positions around the perimeter of Anke. Throughout the day, multiple scout teams scoured more than 2,500 square miles of the Central Highlands for signs of enemy activity. A red team of two armed Hueys from the squadron's aerial weapons platoon often escorted the scouts into high-threat areas. The gunships were armed with up to 48 2.75-inch rockets, four side-mounted miniguns, and two door gunners. The combination of a red team's gunship and a white team's scout resulted in a pink team, the most prevalent and effective tactical combination of the squadron. Together, these hunter-killer teams bravely penetrated deep into enemy territory, probing for enemy forces and looking to start a fight. Our mission as the, as the cavalry troop, within the cavalry squadron, the 1st Cavalry Division, was the eyes and ears of the commander. Find the enemy, locate them, fix them, and either destroy them with what we had on board. 
uh, to bring artillery in or bring an air force in to develop the situation. And that was really key to our mission was to find the enemy and develop the situation so that the commander could then do what he wanted to with the enemy, ignore him, suppress him, kill him, pile on with, with air assault troops, and then to try and you know, fix the enemy and win that part of the fight for that part of the battlefield. Scout pilots were the critical link in the Air Cavalry's mission. While many people couldn't believe that someone was actually willing to assume such a perilous role, most scouts took tremendous pride in their work, developing incredible skills, ingenious tactics, and perhaps even a sixth sense for locating the enemy. They flew right above the treetops, and uh, they would look down into the jungle and uh, be like deer hunters, tracking people down, looking for indications of footprints, uh, along a road or a stream, branches being broken, the fresh foliage being bent over from loads or bicycle tracks in the, on the dirt from guys having bicycles with, with uh, rice or ammunition or rockets on board. They, w they just had an amazing knack for telling you what was there, what might not be there. And something as small as a smoke fire or a cigarette smoke sometime in a still morning air, some guys could smell cigarette smoke and campfires. And that would help us to try and track them down. That's what the scouts did, and the scouts tracked down the enemy. The NVA and Viet Cong quickly learned not to fire on the vulnerable scouts unless they were prepared to confront the wrath of a much larger force. As a result, scout crews often resorted to reconnaissance by fire, hovering in just above suspected enemy positions and spraying the area with bursts of gunfire. If an enemy force broke cover and began firing, a gunship immediately dove in to deliver a massive barrage of rockets and minigun fire. Once they shot back, you had them. You found them and you fixed them. But fixing only for a few seconds, because as soon as they shot, usually they would move away or go in the bunkers. So the scout would often come back into the area and uh, try and upset them, get them mad, or get them to do something unexpected, something they didn't want to do. And what they never wanted to do was to stay in one place so we could put rockets on them, then put artillery on them, and then put airstrikes on them. To prevent the NVA and VC from breaking contact and fleeing into the jungle, the gunships made repeated low-level firing passes over the area. Timing was critical. If the division could commit airstrikes, artillery strikes, and ultimately ground troops rapidly, they could force the elusive communists into an unplanned battle a situation that NVA commanders feared the most. If additional firepower or ground forces were delayed, even by a few minutes, the enemy force often vanished without a trace, and the opportunity to engage was lost. In these situations, the pink team, and indeed the entire division, relied heavily on a third component of the Air Cavalry troop, the bold and courageous men of the rifle platoon. Aero rifle platoons, or blue teams, were the air cavalry's link to the ground. Each platoon was equipped with several Huey lift ships, also known as slicks, which were used to rapidly insert small, lightly armed rifle squads near suspected enemy positions. Their mission was to locate, flush out, and engage enemy troops until reinforcements could be brought in to develop the battle. Every insertion was filled with uncertainty and danger. Landing zones, or LZs, were often nothing more than small clearings in the jungle. Merely bringing a chopper into low hover in the rough, unforgiving terrain of the highlands taxed even the most accomplished flight crews. To make matters worse, enemy forces frequently booby-trapped potential LZs or established ambushes in the dense jungle perimeter. Each second spent in an LZ dramatically increased the crew's chances of being struck by enemy fire. The large, slow Hueys were prized targets for the NVA and Viet Cong. Operating far from the support of friendly forces, the men of the small rifle platoons forged intense bonds of trust and friendship in a common fight to stay alive. Each man's performance, from the pilot of a single ship to the individual infantryman, was critical to the success and survival of the entire team. Troop insertion 
was a daily occurrence for the Cav troops. They could be as many as uh, 15 insertions in one day. Uh, that's bad enough on the, uh, the flight crews because that means that's 15 times that you're exposed to enemy ground fire, but it's even more traumatic for the, the foot soldier because uh, he goes in on the troop transport, he's inserted, he may be in there for 30 minutes, he may be in there for 10 minutes, and he gets back on the aircraft and he says, I survived that one, how many more of these do we have to do today? So it was a constant uh, movement of putting guys on the ground. We had to continually develop the situation of where the enemy was, build up an intelligence database, so to speak. Despite the intensity of rifle platoon missions, most of the men in these units learn to function even in the most terrifying situations because they repeatedly confronted unknown dangers each and every day. Fatigue became one of the greatest threats to lift ship crews and to squadron pilots overall. The constant vibration, deafening noise, and intense concentration associated with helicopter operations led the Army to restrict pilots to four hours of flight time per day. Air cavalry pilots, however, often flew for six, eight, and even 12 hours at a time in their relentless pursuit of enemy forces. Blue teams normally operated with the scouts and gunships of a pink team and what became known as a purple team. During a typical operation, a rifle platoon flew to a forward logger area while a pink team conducted reconnaissance nearby. Staging from logger sites deep in enemy territory, while dangerous, increased the likelihood that the Blues could reach and engage the NVA and Viet Cong before they evaded the scouts and the gunships. While loggered, the rifle squad or other friendly forces in the area established a defensive perimeter around the vulnerable lift ships. Others in the platoon dug foxholes for cover in the event of sniper fire, a mortar attack, or even larger enemy assaults. Throughout the day, the men waited. It could take minutes or hours, but invariably the pink teams would uncover something on the ground that required the insertion of the blues. The sound of artillery or airstrikes nearby often meant that enemy forces had been spotted and that the area was being prepped for an insertion. Once the decision had been made to commit the Blues, every second counted. The rifle squads rushed to take their places aboard the slicks. Every man knew which Huey he was assigned to, the exact position he would take on entering the aircraft, and upon landing, how and when he would exit to provide maximum dispersion in the LZ. The flight crews were equally well coordinated. Each crew knew when they were to lift off, the type of formation they were to fly in, their exact position in that formation, and how, when, and where they were to set down in the LZ. Weather, time of day, terrain, and the location of enemy threats were critical factors during an insertion. The slicks counted on up-to-the-minute recon from the pink team adjusting their formation and insertion strategy in flight as necessary. Initially, the LZ landing zone would be uh, selected by the scout platoon leader. He would go down and make a reconnaissance sometimes at a hover uh, to confirm that uh, there was no punchy stakes in the area, there was no trip lines to go to mines or any other enemy activity. So I would normally go in next with uh, the gunship as a lead and do reconnaissance by fire. Uh, the, the door gunners uh, would be looking left and right as we made that final straight in pass, uh, scanning the tree lines on their side and firing in there to see if they could draw fire. And then if we had the mix, the quad uh, 60s mounted on the side, we could rotate those straight down and elevate a little bit, not far enough to hit the blades, hopefully, left and, and, and right, and then the rockets would be firing and you'd normally just make one pass to see if you drew any fire. And there would be two guys uh, in that lead. Uh, in my case, it would be myself and then my wingman. And my wingman's job was to protect my butt. Uh, if there was any fire that came on up uh, and, and we didn't see it, 
Uh, he would see it, immediately put a press of fire on it and tell us to break right or break left. And then we would reevaluate, could we go back in and destroy the target, the enemy, or should we move the ships coming into another landing zone? So then the sequence would roll in, and we would go into a daisy chain on both sides. Uh, two ships on one side, two ships on the other side, and if we had any other guns, uh, they'd be flying outside that perimeter to see if there was any movement of the enemy coming out of that area, or more dangerously, any enemy forces coming in. And then we, the guns, and the scouts would remain circling that area, continuing making passes, and if they made contact, they immediately gained uh, radio contact with us through smoke, from the smoke that give us a direction of the enemy, and then we would roll in and uh, fire our rockets or machine guns. Now, when I say we fired rockets and machine guns, we would never stop firing until we were within 700 meters. The rocket, by nature, was never designed to be used for close air support, but we did that because we had the confidence in our people and we knew exactly how close we could get. There were occasions that we fired within 20 meters of our soldiers. Within seconds of touching down in the LZ, the slicks were lifting off again to avoid taking fire from enemy forces in the immediate area. The flight crews usually headed to the nearest refueling area where they rapidly prepared their ships for a return flight to extract the rifle squads. In many instances, the Blues were in contact from the minute they set down in the LZ. In others, they met with absolutely no resistance. Even when no contact was made, the troops still performed a critical mission for the division as they searched for signs of enemy activity. NVA and Viet Cong troops were lightly equipped so that they could move more quickly. To support offensive campaigns, the communists stashed weapons, ammunition, and other supplies ahead of time in hamlets, tunnels, or along jungle trails. The troops of the rifle platoon generally probed these same areas in an attempt to locate enemy troops or to develop intelligence about recent activity. As a result, they often uncovered enemy staging areas, supply stores, and weapons caches. When significant finds were made, additional ground units were inserted to provide security and to expand the search. At times, it was clear that enemy forces had been present just minutes before the platoon's arrival. Developing intelligence was a critical component of the rifle platoon's mission. Hamlets, bunkers, and the surrounding terrain were thoroughly searched for maps, battle plans, or any other documents that might provide an indication of enemy strength and objectives. Captured North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops provided some of the most valuable information. When possible, prisoners were immediately interrogated regarding the position, strength, and movement of other forces in the area. Periodically, the Blues uncovered large weapons caches containing hundreds of rifles, machine guns, rockets, and grenades. The cache sites were often positioned near enemy objectives or staging areas, providing the division with intelligence on impending offensives. Other important finds included hidden food stores, some of which contained enough rice to feed hundreds of troops for days. Once hidden provisions had been discovered, the Blues generally continued to search the immediate area, while other elements of the division recovered or destroyed the supplies. When no contact could be established, the rifle squads notified the lift ships of their position and requested extraction from the area. If the patrol had traveled far or if they needed to be extracted quickly to follow up on new leads, a makeshift LZ was carved out of the nearest available clearing. By the end of 1965, the 1st Cavalry Division had succeeded in shutting down the NVA's offensive in the Highlands and validating the concept of an air mobile division in combat. 
The Air Cavalry Squadron proved to be a critical factor in the division's operations. The success of the squadron eventually led to the creation of other Air Cavalry units, which were incorporated into the operations of existing U.S. divisions. Despite the squadron's initial accomplishments, their role in the war had only just begun. For nearly six more years, the world's first air cavalry unit would relentlessly pursue NVA and Viet Cong forces throughout the highlands of Vietnam and beyond. Air cavalry reconnaissance missions were inherently unpredictable. Every man in the squadron knew that they could stumble into a major battle at any time. That, in fact, was their goal. On March 30th, 1966, that's exactly what happened as the 1st of the 9th returned to patrol the western edges of the Central Highlands. We were back in the area working, uh, trying to develop uh, some additional indications, intelligence-wise, about enemy movements coming in, because they're always coming across that Cambodia border. No matter what the State Department said, the Secretary of Defense, or President Johnson said, it was a major staging area on the other side of that Cambodia border. A pink team working the area had fired on suspected enemy positions, but was unable to draw return fire. Air Force fighters conducted low-level bombing runs, but also received nothing in return. Suspecting that a well-trained enemy element was in the vicinity, Squadron Command ordered a rifle platoon in to develop the situation on the ground. Captain Dave Allen, commander of the squadron's air weapons platoon, requested additional airstrikes in response to concerns about enemy threats in the area. Fearing that further delay could result in a lost opportunity to engage the enemy, the request was denied and the decision was made to insert the blues. Captain Allen and his pilot, Dave Fields, led the gunships of the weapons platoon as they escorted the lift ships into the area. I think all of us, and even more so in retrospect, as you remember these things, you had this uneasy feeling that this was not going to be a normal type mission. We went out there, we put the infantry on the ground the same way we did other insertions. The scouts made the low level recon, picked out the landing zone. The lift birds started coming in a long final uh, ether and trail or in a staggered formation, preceded by the guns. We recon by fire and I will be damned we didn't draw a bit of fire out of that landing zone. Satisfied that an insertion could be made safely, the gunships escorted the slicks into the landing zone. Within seconds, the ships were touching down and the troopers were fanning out across the LZ. Circling above, the gunships continued to monitor the platoon's progress, ready to lay down a barrage of suppressive fire at the first sign of trouble. Moments later, the slicks were lifting off again, and the platoon was left to scour the area for signs of enemy activity. Ten minutes had gone by, and the guys on the ground said, we've got a prisoner, NVA prisoner. Yes. The NVA president tells us that there are a thousand soldiers who have been who are surrounded. The decision was made to get our ass out of there. Lift ships have gone in the wrong direction. Gunships have done half their load. No artillery is capable to get in there. Uh, Air Force is not available. Uh, and it turned into a major battle in which we lost uh, people and aircraft. Uh, you get down to the point that uh, in a matter of 30 to 45 minutes, uh, it was all over. Uh, we lost uh, a lift ship in the LZ. Uh, it was shot down uh, and crashed uh, right in front of me. Another lift ship took off, had the controls shot out. Both pilots, one was blinded. The other one was, uh, was hit uh, in the shoulders and the arms and was incapacitated. Crew chief was able to fly the aircraft back about 10 or 15 miles with no hydraulics, no flying experience. A uh, young soldier just in the heat of battle knew what he had to do and pulled back uh, the incapacitated pilot, got in the seat and flew the aircraft. I lost two gunships. We recovered our own crews. Uh, we lost conditional uh, lift ship, trying to get out the remaining guys. And uh, the word was, you know, just 
cut our losses, lick our wounds, and uh, wait till we get some reinforcements to come in here. Uh, the last runs with our gunships was no ammunition. Uh, we had sea ration cans full of food. Uh, we had uh, submachine guns. Uh, I had a uh, uh, submachine gun in my lap. I had a 38 caliber strapped to my, to my waist. And on our last two passes, uh, that's what we used. We th were throwing sea ration cans out the window. Uh, at the enemy, I had a M5 system on the front of the aircraft, the only one on the troop. It carried 150 rounds in that, and it was rapidly uh, expended. And you knew that your ass was, was hanging out on a limb, that you were going to get shot down, and you saw guys in front of you just got aircraft completely blow on up and people's bodies being thrown out of the thing. But you also knew that uh, you were being paid uh, to provide that organization with, with, with firepower, and when they crashed, it was your responsibility to, to the last moment to do the best you could to get them out of there. And uh, we all did. We were terrified. And I can remember when that thing started to unfold and we had no more ammunition. And I turned to Dave, I said, get out your 38. I got mine on my side and sea rations were going back in. And he said, is anybody gonna follow us? And I said, Dave, I don't give a damn. It's, the, it's you and I, but those guys gotta follow us. I know it. So I get on the radio and called. And even to this day, I can hear my voice, which is several, several octaves higher, and sounded as if I had cotton in my mouth. And all I got in return was, Roger, Red, we're behind you. And uh, they went right on in there and uh, took their licks. But there were decisions made in that as to, do we go back in? Do we put uh, ourselves on the line? And uh, there are no heroes in situations like that. You, you react because of your training. And we were a well-trained unit. Fire support from the gunship succeeded in keeping pressure off the beleaguered rifle platoon and prevented a major disaster. Additional elements were eventually brought in to relieve the force, but by the following morning, the battle was clearly over. In a pattern that became all too familiar, the North Vietnamese had broken contact and retreated during the night. By early 1966, the NVA had felt the barbs of the air cavalry enough times to learn that scouts, gunships, and rifle platoons were just the tip of the iceberg. If any one of these elements compromised an NVA position, they realized that an avalanche of troops would soon be piled into the area to engage them in battle. An intensive search was mounted for enemy combat elements, but virtually none could be found. Some light resistance was encountered. However, it was evident that the main body of the force was probably miles from the area and had likely crossed back into Cambodia, well beyond the reach of U.S. forces. The cavalry troopers had undoubtedly inflicted heavy damage on the NVA. Some have estimated that hundreds of enemy troops were killed or wounded. However, the exact number of enemy casualties in this and many other engagements would never be known. NVA and Viet Cong forces regularly took enormous risks to sanitize battle areas as they withdrew, removing most of their dead and wounded and any weapons or supplies before U.S. troops could arrive. Some of these risks were taken out of respect for the dead and a desire to save the wounded. Others were taken as part of a well-orchestrated plan to erode political support for the war effort by eliminating evidence from successful Allied operations. The March 30th battle was largely the result of chance, or what was typically known in the Air Cavalry Squadron as a meeting engagement, rather than an outright enemy ambush. The NVA and Viet Cong knew that cavalry units were always out looking for them. The Communists made every effort to conceal their positions and to maintain strict fire discipline. At the same time, they were always prepared to unleash a powerful attack against the cavalry if discovered. The men of the rifle platoons often paid most dearly for this. Most of their casualties were taken during the last critical moments of an insertion, as the slicks were touching down when the enemy became certain that their positions were in jeopardy. However, without the troopers' courageous efforts to develop the situation on the ground, many large NVA operations may have remained unchallenged and resulted in even greater losses for U.S. and Allied forces throughout Vietnam.
1968, the strength of the Air Cavalry's hunter-killer teams was dramatically increased with the arrival of the Bell AH-1 Huey Cobra. The Cobra, which rapidly replaced the Cavalry's modified Huey gunships, was the world's first helicopter designed specifically for armed combat. These powerful, highly maneuverable attack birds could carry up to 52 rockets in side-mounted pods and were equipped with a rotating chin turret that housed a combination of grenade launchers and miniguns. A two-man team operated the gunship in a unique arrangement that placed a gunner in the nose of the aircraft and a pilot slightly above and behind him to increase combat visibility. The hunter killers were further strengthened by the arrival of the Hughes OH-6 Cayuse, a light observation helicopter more commonly known as the Loach. This small, fast, and nimble aircraft replaced the outdated and vulnerable Sioux Scout as the cavalry's primary reconnaissance vehicle. The Loach was armed with a minigun, which the pilot fired from the left side of the aircraft, and a 60 caliber machine gun, which was fired by a door gunner in the rear. Next to the Huey, the Loach became the most widely used helicopter of the Vietnam War and proved to be an invaluable addition to the Air Cavalry's fleet. Despite the introduction of new and improved aircraft, the strategies and organization of the squadron essentially remained unchanged from the experimental days of the 11th Air Assault Division. In fact, scout pilots used the fast and agile Loach to probe even closer to suspected North Vietnamese and Viet Cong positions. As a general rule, if a new scout lasted for a couple of months, he would be able to survive even the most hair-raising encounters. Still, the chances remained high that he would eventually be brought down. Some of the terms we had back then was, we go fishing. We go fishing with three people, and three people were in a loach. And uh, these guys, uh, you know, did some tremendous things, but we went fishing with people. To prevent the loss of a loach, the squadron developed sophisticated and extremely precise tactics for employing the Cobra's potent new weapon systems. Flying roughly a thousand feet above, but slightly behind the loach, the Cobra's flight team watched and waited, poised to strike at the first sign of trouble. If the scout pilot decided it was time to pull power and get out of there very quickly, the front seater, or the x-rays we called them, uh, his job with the minigun was to have his hand on the action bar and the turret so if the, the loach took fire, he could have minigun rounds down around the loach, behind him preferably, not in front of him, within about 15 seconds, 10 or 15 seconds, and we practiced that. If you, did, if you couldn't do it and you got all flustered in the front seat and you couldn't put steel on target in less than 15 seconds, you didn't fly anymore as a front seat because you couldn't support the loach. Now, as the aircraft commander, then while you're doing that, you're moving the aircraft in to get a line so you can shoot rockets because it may be he stumbled upon the lead of, a, say, a company size force, one or 200 people, maybe a regiment. You, know, you don't really know. So you want to be able to put rockets down around him in case he's flying the wrong direction. If he's flying the wrong direction into more enemy troops and their fire discipline is, is controlled where now they can shoot at any helicopter because they've exposed themselves, then you want to be able to put rockets down around him, behind him, or in front of him maybe, and in less than 30 seconds you want rockets impacting around the loach to help suppress the fire so he can get out of there. And you're hoping, you're rolling the dice, will that loach get out of there without getting hit or getting shot down? Despite the intense and even heroic attempts of gunship crews to prevent scout losses, there was often nothing that could be done. Scout crews suffered some of the highest casualty rates of any U.S. servicemen. Over 650 loaches alone were shot down. More than 22% of all U.S. helicopters lost in combat. Losing a scout crew was perhaps the worst fear of a gunship pilot flying in the Air Cavalry Squadron. The crews of the hunter-killer teams often forged intense bonds as they confronted danger and even death on a daily basis. On August 9, 1969, a pink team was sent to investigate a large enemy store of rice for a potential airstrike. As was often the case, however, they uncovered something far greater in the process. K-2 
Captain Joe Bowen was commanding the pink team's Cobra gunship as it flew cover for the scout below. We got up there in about 8.15 in the morning. Uh, Steve Young, which was 1-2, and I've flown with Steve quite a bit in, in, in scouts with him, as an observer with him. And uh, he's checking out the rice, and uh, it's, it's a lot of rice, and yes, it's good for an airstrike. We're waiting for the fighters to get on station, and the fighters are a little late. So we, uh, we started going back west. He said he thought he saw some activity, recent activity, about two kilometers to the west of where the rice was. So we headed back west. I was, again, at about 1,000 feet behind him and above him, and he was going about, uh, about 100 miles an hour uh, to get to this other area he saw recent activity. And uh, all of a sudden, all around him, both sides of him, uh, it was just uh, flashes, muzzle flashes. And he got off one call. Said, one, two, taking fire, going down, going down. And uh, he immediately tumbled and blew up. And uh, I'm right behind him, just couldn't believe that it happened. Uh, called a mayday, down, down bird. I'm going down. The front seat, Gene Olson, who was killed a little later on January. He's put minigun fire down around him, but we can see where he's at because he's a ball of fire where he went in. Uh, I'm putting rockets down and flechettes down around the enemy. And it, it wasn't a normal for us. We didn't see maybe 15, 20 people at one time. If, if we saw that many people in the open, it was a big event. We may have seen 15 or 20 people three or four times during the day, but we never saw a big company size unit. And this was the biggest I'd ever seen. These were hundreds of people, and they came out of the tree line shooting. Uh, they've been exposed, and they started shooting. And uh, I made it down, don't know how, and came on down around them. And our, and our job was to, you know, find, it, find the enemy and fix them. But our job to ourselves was to uh, take care of each other. And uh, we, we tried that. For Steve and his crew, uh, uh, they, they were killed. And uh, we would, would risk everything to try and recover, you know, our friends. But we didn't know if everybody was dead. The forces inbound, their enemy around, uh, they're shooting, and I'm hovering around, and, and they're scared. They look like brand new uniforms, you know, fresh troops. So, like that battle calculus you're thinking about. It's fresh troops, scared, just been, you know, conscripted or whatever. They're shooting, but they're shooting, aiming to the left, and you're in front of them, so they're not good shots. So, they're probably more scared than we are. And uh, Gene and I, we're, you know, we're, we're just, you know, we're terrified ourselves. And, uh, I thought I was taking a couple of hits, and Gene was talking about it. It was my knees bouncing inside the crew compartment. I was so afraid. I, my knees were banging back and forth. We got to hover down around him and uh, could look down, and you could see uh, Steve and, and Sieber at the front seat, uh, the left observer, still in their seats burning. Could not see the door gunner. And weren't sure if the door gunner had been thrown out before an impact or not. So because we had a down bird, and potentially one of our soldiers, one of our cab troopers on the ground alive, uh, the full force of the rescue and take care of your own was in process. There was an unspoken bond in the cavalry squadron that if you went down, no matter what happened, someone would always come for you. Within minutes of Captain Bowen's call, slicks from the squadron's rifle platoon had lifted off and were en route to the downed scout. At the same time, gunships from the weapons platoon were racing in to provide fire support, and up to an additional battalion of the division's infantry were being airlifted into the area. Despite the potential danger on the ground, the rifle platoon was inserted to secure a landing zone near the crash site. Initially, the rifle platoon and two platoons of infantry from a quick reaction force encountered light resistance in and around the LZ. As they were attempting to secure the area, another infantry company was inserted to support those already on the ground. Almost immediately, a heavy firefight broke out and the entire force was pinned down. As the fight intensified, the men were forced to set up defensive positions around the LZ. Throughout the morning, additional reinforcements arrived in an attempt to expand the defensive perimeter until a full infantry battalion had become engaged in the battle. It soon became apparent that the enemy force was much larger than anyone had expected. Realizing that his troops were overcommitted and that they were being overwhelmed, the battalion commander requested that the entire force be extracted from the area. 
Ultimately, the troops had to wait until last light before they could be pulled to safety. At least four Americans were killed and 20 were wounded during the engagement. However, while the damage inflicted on the cavalry was significant, the overall situation could have been much worse. Because of the battle, American commanders were alerted to the fact that at least an entire NVA regiment had crossed the Cambodian border and was preparing for a major offensive. The following night, a series of massive attacks were launched against Allied installations nearby. Until the cavalry's engagement, few knew that an enemy force of that size was operating anywhere near the area, let alone that one was mounting a large-scale offensive. While the battle itself was not characteristic of most cavalry operations, many critical elements of the incident were. A scout crew's courageous and skillful attempts to locate the enemy prompted the entire engagement. The willingness of squadron troopers to risk everything to recover downed comrades developed the situation on the ground. The speed and flexibility of the entire force in responding to changing conditions produced an all-out battle with the NVA. In the end, the squadron's initial contact provided Allied forces with enough warning to prepare for the enemy's offensive, possibly preventing a major disaster and saving dozens, if not hundreds, of lives. Throughout most of the Vietnam War, Allied forces were prohibited from striking enemy sanctuaries located in Laos and Cambodia. The restrictions were especially frustrating for the troops of the 1st Cavalry Division, who routinely engaged North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops during offensives launched from these areas. On May 1, 1970, the frustration ended at least temporarily, as the division launched a massive incursion into Cambodia in conjunction with the South Vietnamese Army. Throughout the two-month campaign, the division's air cavalry squadron proved once again to be a critical component of successful air mobile operations. From escorting a massive flight of slicks into a secured landing zone to performing intensive aerial and ground reconnaissance, the squadron became the workhorse of the entire campaign. The assault was designed to take the fight to the enemy by defeating the communists in their own backyard. The targets were the hidden base camps and supply stores that had plagued U.S. and Allied forces since the early 1960s. Key to the entire operation was the speed, flexibility, and element of surprise inherent in an air mobile fighting force overall, and in the air cavalry's tactics in particular. The assault was a dramatic success. Perhaps the greatest discovery of the campaign was an area that came to be known as the city. Air cavalry reconnaissance had uncovered a well-developed enemy planning, training, and storage area that spanned more than three square kilometers. Further probing uncovered more than 180 storage bunkers, 18 mess halls, classrooms, a firing range, and even a small animal farm. While NVA forces had evacuated the site, captured supply records and other intelligence indicated that the area had served as a well-organized storage depot and training facility for replacement troops being sent from North Vietnam. Supplies captured from this cache site alone included more than 1,500 infantry and anti-aircraft guns. 2 million rounds of ammunition, 58,000 pounds of plastic explosives, 22 cases of anti-personnel mines, thousands of grenades and mortars, and nearly 30 tons of rice. The move into Cambodia exceeded all expectations and proved to be one of the most successful operations in the history of the 1st Cavalry Division. While controversial, Many argued that such an offensive should have been mounted much sooner. If Allied forces had been able to prevent the communists from amassing troops and supplies just outside of South Vietnam, it is possible that the outcome of the war would have been very different.
Throughout the Cambodian campaign and the entire Vietnam War, the 1st Cavalry Division repeatedly demonstrated the potency of air mobility, redefining the capabilities of conventional ground forces forever. However, the division's extraordinary success may never have been possible without the scouts, the gunships, and the rifle platoons of the division's Air Cavalry Squadron. It was their courageous attempts to seek out and engage the enemy that enabled the notion of an air mobile division to be taken from concept to reality in the jungles and marshlands of South Vietnam.